Let's turn to our passages today. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. Listen as I read. And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Well, Paul has given us here a sort of summary of how we preach the gospel. Well, let's look at this closely this morning. Paul would go from town to town. He would speak in the Jewish synagogues and in people's homes. And when he came to the Corinthians, listen to how he preached. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. Paul says that when he came to the Corinthian church, he, he didn't come preaching with any superiority of wisdom or some special wisdom. He didn't present himself as some kind of eloquent speaker. He didn't come across <clears throat> as if he were wiser than everyone else in the room. He, he came simply proclaiming the testimony of God. Verse 2 says, For I determined, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so Paul was determined to know nothing among them except Christ and him crucified. His message was the gospel. His message was Jesus Christ crucified for our sins. That was his singular, simple, clear, and consistent message. He didn't bring in politics. He didn't bring in the state of the nation. He didn't bring in the various issues of the Roman Empire. He didn't bring in man's wisdom. He didn't bring in philosophy. He didn't bring in anything else. He preached the scriptures, and specifically, he preached Christ crucified for our sins. His goal was to bring people into the kingdom of God. And the only way a person can be brought into the kingdom of God, the only way a person can be saved is through Jesus Christ. Acts 4.12 says, And there is no salvation, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. So Paul, without superiority of speech or wisdom, preached Christ crucified. That was his main message. It was simple, it was powerful, it was consistent. Look at verse 3. Paul goes even further. He says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And so Paul said he was with the Corinthians in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And that raises a question this morning. Why was Paul in weakness? Why was he in fear and trembling when he was preaching to the Corinthians? Well, I'd like to look at three possibilities this morning. There could be more, but I want to look at three possibilities this morning. One possibility why Paul was preaching in weakness and fear and trembling. It seems from some other scriptures that Paul very likely had some physical weaknesses or illnesses. Some people think Paul had an affliction or illness with his eyes. He says in Galatians 4.15, Where then is that sense of blessing you had? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. Why would Paul say you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me if it were possible? Why would he say that? Well, some theologians believe Paul had a problem with his eyes. Furthermore, when he says he came to the Corinthians in much weakness and fear and trembling, the Bible says he had a thorn in his flesh. The Bible says that God put a thorn in his flesh. Remember how Paul brought Paul up to heaven? Paul actually got to see and experience just a bit of heaven, and then the Lord sent him back to the earth to continue preaching the gospel. But when he sent Paul back, God put a thorn in his flesh so that he would stay humble and, and not exalt himself. Listen to this account. 2 Corinthians 12, 2. I know a man in Christ who was 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or out of the body I do not know. God knows. Such a man was caught up to the third heaven. 
And I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. On behalf of such a man, I will not boast. Uh, On behalf of such a man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except in regard to my weaknesses. For if I do wish to boast, I will not be foolish, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from this so that no one will credit me with more than he sees in me or hears from me. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul saw heaven. He was brought there by God. And to keep him from being exalted from this amazing experience, God had to put a thorn in his flesh. Now, we don't really know what this thorn in the flesh was. It it could have been a literal thorn, but most likely it was some other type of affliction. Paul probably was metaphorical when he called it a thorn in the flesh. Whatever it was, it was bad enough that Paul begged God to remove it. But God didn't. He knew that Paul needed it. And so in our verse today, Paul says he came to the Corinthians in in weakness and and in fear and in trembling. Was it a condition of his eyes? Was it some kind of thorn in the flesh? Was this weakness and fear and trembling a physical illness? Could have been. Might have been a contributing factor. There's a second possibility. A second possibility as to why Paul was preaching in weakness and fear and trembling. Here's what it might be. He could have been weak and in fear and trembling simply because Christ himself personally commissioned Paul to preach. And consider this. Paul was sent on a mission. He was given a job to do a task to do from the Lord Christ himself, personally. He was to deliver deliver the gospel message to the Gentiles. He had had been persecuting the church. He had been persecuting Christ's followers. And and now the Lord, the one who he had been persecuting, had stopped him in his tracks, and the Lord saved him. And the Lord sent him out to preach the gospel. He was the, the very gospel he was once trying to eradicate. Could it be that he had weakness and fear and trembling just realizing Who sent him? Could he have weakness and fear and trembling just knowing that Jesus stopped him right in his tracks, had mercy on his soul, and saved him, and then sent him out as an apostle? What an encounter with the Lord himself. Let me refresh your mind as to what happened to Paul. It's amazing. There was a time when Paul was called Saul. He was a very high-ranking Jew. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was a religious leader, a, a, a high religious leader. And he saw this new sect, this new religion called Christianity, sometimes called the way. And he saw it as a threat to Judaism. And he hated the Christians with a passion. He did not believe that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah. And he saw this whole new religion as a blasphemy on Judaism. And he had so much passion in his hatred that he went and he got permission from his superiors to go out hunting Christians. That's what he was doing, hunting Christians. He went from town to town and village to village. And whenever he found them, He bound them in chains. He put them in prisons and dungeons. He separated husbands and wives. He broke up families. He may have even caused the death of some of these Christians. Most likely he did. 
And now he is on a hateful mission again. He's going to the city of Damascus. He is determined to find some of these Christians and arrest them and make an example of them. And listen to what happens. Acts 9, verse 1. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting, but get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days and without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias? And he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, get up and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and after laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized. Saul, who later became Paul, he was stopped in his tracks by Jesus Christ himself. He went from persecuting Christians to preaching Christ crucified. He was told what he must do by Jesus Christ personally. After an experience like that, could that be why he preached in weakness and fear and trembling? Think about that encounter. Truly an encounter with Christ himself. Christ in his glory. The brilliant light of Christ was so magnificent that he was blinded. He lost his sight. Did it have a lasting effect? Undoubtedly. Could it be? Could it have made him have a, a sincerity, a seriousness, a a a deep gravity in his commission to preach the gospel to the point that he preached it with fear and weakness and trembling. An encounter with Christ. Think of the impact. When the apostle John saw Jesus Christ in his glory, <clears throat> the Bible says he fell down like a dead man. Listen to this encounter. Revelation 1.13, here's John. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe reaching to the feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, and when it has been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters, in his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. 
And he placed his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. I'm the first and the last and the living one. And I was dead and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and of Hades. A similar thing happened to the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah 6.1, it says, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two, he covered his face, and with two, he covered his feet, and with two, he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out, while the temple was filling with smoke, then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. John saw Jesus in his glory, and he fell down like a dead man. Isaiah saw the Lord in the temple, and he said, Woe to me, for I am ruined. Paul, after having such of an experience, such an encounter with the Lord himself, it, it could have filled him up with weakness and fear and trembling. And from then on, as he fulfilled this most serious calling from the Lord, as he went about doing the Lord's work, it would be very possible for him to continue to have some weakness and fear and trembling as he even thought about who it was who gave him this assignment. Christ the Lord. Christian, if you were ever to encounter the Lord in his glory, it might not be how you think it would be. The Lord in his mercy has concealed himself from us when we are in our weak physical state, living on this earth. We're not yet glorified. We're not powerful. We're not strong. We're weak. We're dust. If the Lord revealed himself to us in his glory, we too would fall down like a dead man. And we would only revive if the Lord put his hand on us and said, do not be afraid. And with his power, revived us. If the Lord then gave you a mission if he came to you in his glory and he gave you a task to fulfill, after an encounter like that, you might do the same thing Paul did. You might preach with fear and weakness and trembling. Paul took his calling very seriously and he very likely, from then on, even though he was bold, even though he was strong in the Lord, yet at the same time, there was fear and there was trembling and there was weakness, knowing who it was who commissioned him. You can see Paul's serious reverence, amen? John fell like a dead man. Isaiah said he was ruined. A side note, Christian, do not speak flippantly about the Lord. I almost don't even want to say this because it's so awful for me to say this. But I just want to tell you, when people say words like the big guy in the sky, forgive me for even saying that. It is so irreverent. It is so unworthy. It is so unbecoming of a Christian to talk that way. He is the King of kings and the Lord of hosts. Psalm 211 says, Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. 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 But let's look at a third possibility. A third possibility as to why 
Paul was filled with weakness and fear and trembling as he preached to the Corinthians. Here's the third possibility. The very magnitude of the message that he was preaching. Paul said in verse 2, For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Consider the magnitude of this message. Could it be that he came to the Corinthians in weakness and in fear and in trembling simply because of the importance and the serious nature of the message he was bringing? Preaching the gospel is no small thing. It is truly a message from God, and your eternity depends on how you respond to it. It must be taken seriously, and it must be delivered seriously. There are a lot of things that people talk about in life. There's a lot of important topics that are lectured on and taught in schools and colleges and, and, and universities and books and all kinds of things every single day, but there is no message like the gospel. What message could truly have more importance than the gospel? Paul is going to these Corinthians. He had persecuted Christians, but now Christ had stopped him. Christ had saved him, and Christ had given him the task of preaching to the Gentiles. And the message he was to, pre to preach, it came directly and personally from the very Son of God, Jesus Christ. And this message was so important, and still is. This message was so important that Paul was to dedicate his life to preaching it. Consider that this message was and still is so important that a person's eternity depends on how they respond to it. There's no message like this on all the earth. There's no message that's even close to like anything like this. It's a message that could make any preacher be filled with weakness and fear and trembling. When I speak the gospel, I'm sometimes fearful that I haven't preached it with the passion it deserves, or I'm fearful that I haven't been able to emphasize the importance of this simple message. I'm fearful that as I preach, this message has become so commonplace that it's, it's not received or delivered with the seriousness or the gravity that it warrants. And yet I know that it's God who will lay this message on a person's heart, not me. I can see how Paul would preach in weakness and fear and trembling and how any preacher would preach in weakness and fear and trembling when you're delivering a message of such magnitude. The gospel is so simple and it's so clear and so plain that a child can understand it and at the same time there's no message so profound in all the earth. Let me just say in as simple words as I can, Here's the gospel. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. He paid the penalty on the cross for you. And if you turn to him as a needy sinner, if you desire to be forgiven and you desire to be saved, if you want eternal life, if you simply look to him for salvation and believe in him, the Bible says you'll be saved. But if you refuse him, you'll be damned and lost forever. It is as simple and plain and clear as that. Think of the magnitude of that message. It's not a message that we have to convince somebody of or argue about. We simply state it because it's God's truth. Receive it and live or reject it at your eternal peril. Look at our verse again, 1 Corinthians 2, 1. And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Look at verse 4. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Paul, though he preached in weakness and fear and trembling, 
And he didn't use persuasive words of wisdom. Yet he knew this. When he preached, there was a demonstration of the Spirit and of power so that the people, so that the faith people had would not rest on the wisdom of the preacher, but on the power of God. Let me explain this. When a preacher simply preaches the gospel, when he preaches the word of God in his weakness and in his fear and in his trembling without using persuasive words, without using words of wisdom, without being clever, without any theatrics, when he just simply preaches the word of God in its simplicity, God the Holy Spirit will demonstrate his power by taking that word and delivering it into the hearts of those who hear. Is a spirit of God who will take the simple words of the preacher from the word of God and put it into your hearts. It's a demonstration of the power of God. And so let me preach to you in weakness and fear and trembling without man's persuasive wisdom. Let me preach in such a way that the Holy Spirit will demonstrate his power in your heart if it's going to affect you at all. And so here again, let me just repeat the simple message of the gospel, the message Paul preached, the message every faithful gospel preacher has preached ever since throughout all the centuries. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. He paid the penalty for them in your place. He came to save you from sin and from death and from hell. Isaiah 45, 22 says, Turn to me and be saved. All the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is no other. If you turn to him as a needy sinner, if you desire to be forgiven, if you desire to be saved, if you simply look to him for salvation and believe in him, the Bible says you will be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But if you refuse him, If you reject him, if you turn away, you'll be damned and lost forever. Receive Jesus Christ and live or reject him at your eternal peril. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that the gospel message is so simple and so clear and so plain that a child could understand it. We thank you, Father, for sending your son, Jesus, to die for our sins. We thank you that you just tell us, look look to me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. Father, I pray today if someone's hearing this message, Lord God, call them to you, draw them to you, cause them to be born again. Lord, cause them to look to you and be saved. Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.